Right, uh, greetings friends, uh, fellow humans, uh, winning sperms. Um, this video is going to be about, um, just want to give some context and uh, try a bit of understanding to what this video is about because I was quite um, animated because I was traumatised and triggered so please forgive me for the, um, the way I articulate myself and uh, I've been traumatised from the womb, and that, that, that's almost like a frontal lobotomy, the trauma. Then I was deliberately traumatised in private when I was two, and se severely bloodied and attacked by a, a beast. Uh, I witnessed my grandfather completely overtaken by, by the devil and it, it just completely destroyed me and I blanked that out for 38 years um, it absolutely shattered me and then the trauma the trauma continued continued, and I was kept in isolation and abused in private so in, in um, hindsight and uh, having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ um, and, and being granted his Holy Spirit and, and wisdom and the grace to help me overcome by his spirit my uh, dis dissociated brain and life and disassociations like being detached from reality um, I can recall several experiences in my life where I've not you don't you, you're disconnected from when something's really serious like illness or a danger not all the time it, it's just it's usually when um, it's you, you, yourself rather than other people and I'm not saying that to be uh, pious or anything it, it's usually in, in a certain area where you disconnect but there's other areas where you spring out and you're able to associate like, like an average person's associated uh, most of the time they're on the ball with disassociations like being locked down in your boots and you can't you can't articulate yourself. You and if you're triggered, you you're, you're detached from what's happening to you. It's a natural, it's a natural conditioning of trauma. It's blocked out. So if you're re, if you're kept traumatized, you're 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 in that constant state, and that constant state is um, is there. And and if you're, and then it stunts your development. You fall behind in life, and then then you, you hit all these problems. One of my uh, and, and, and experience that, that will leave you, um, with me, me personally, in my life and circumstances, I, I severely, one of, one of those severely addicted personalities, I'd, I'd want everything and everything and everything and just keep more and more and it, it was just um, a bottomless uh, void to fill. And the only one who, who completely filled that life and that void was uh, my Saviour, my God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, that helped me grasp and lift me out of that disassociated state. But that's that's what I am default. So I remain in that state and under constant uh, trauma. Um, now this video is about the ongoing trauma and, and and also I had a car accident which was um, I'm certain it was staged because of in hindsight looking reviewing it and again at the time I had disassociated I, and um, I was so uh, pumped with adrenaline but I was still disassociated and the uh, the whole thing was um, in hindsight I saw it was staged it was uh, it was either by ambiguous behaviour and just the the nature of people and the behaviour but to me it was more contrived and it links into uh, speaking out against the Mormon church. It happened when I uh, called out the Mormon church and, uh, and my uh, trauma based conditioning is related to um, a branch in the Mormon church, that's my I haven't got any uh, physical evidence of that, but being on the end of the fruit, I, I I can I can join the dots up, but it's very hard to articulate. So I 
I, I was hit over 40 mile an hour. My air, but the airbag didn't go off, and I was stationary, and, and uh, somebody drove straight through me in, in f at full speed, and I could hear their engine. It was um, full revs, and this person just didn't see me and clobbered me. My airbag didn't go off, and so my brain just hit in my head. Uh, my larynx, uh, my diaphragm break. All my all my jowls have popped out, and I, I could, it's painful to swallow. I've got a damaged neck, damaged cartilage, and, the, and where the, because of the severity of the impact, I've, I, I really hurt my shoulder. And uh, I was distracted speaking to the ambulance driver, and uh, I pulled off the road into a car park because I, I was knocked broad on side across the road, and I thought, well, I don't want to be sit leaving the car in case there's another accident. So I, I pulled over and then went to, went to the old lady who'd hit me. And she couldn't figure out what had happened, and uh, she was like bewildered by it. She just could, she wasn't on her phone or anything like that. She just she she couldn't explain it, and she um, apologised profusely. And I was about to clobber this selfish person, and then, and then that she when I saw the old lady, it softened my heart, and I thought, well, you know, I made sure she was alright. And then the ambulance arrived Im immediately. And um, I think another ambulance turned up. I can't remember, but I I was sitting in the ambulance with the driver, and he assessed me, asking me all these questions, and then he filled out the report. And then I left the ambulance and went to went 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 to my car, where I parked my car. And I found all the doors open, the boot open, the glove box open, and the I think the bonnet had been opened. Now. In that be, being disassociated, you don't, you, you're not switched on. You, and plus, I was a heavy impact. I was cloud. You know, when you, your adrenaline's rushing, you could, you don't feel any pain, and you're quite on cloud nine, and you feel like you could throw a car over the hedge. You're so pumped, and I was in that state. Now, that wasn't. That's one of the questions on the ambulance report. Now, he didn't record that. The uh, speed of the out, in, impact was falsified. Because um, and the police never investigated the accident thoroughly. Uh, the amount of police that turned up raced up to the scene, and then it was overtaken by the people who. Were, it was almost like uh, dominated by these two, and I could tell they were bent coppers because one was very passive and doing the other's bidding. One was a woman, and one was a black, and they were like cold as ice. And I said, "What are you going through my car? What do you think I'm a, dr a gun dealer or a drug dealer or something?" And they'd rifled the ashtray, and my airbag didn't go off, and I didn't really consider it till afterwards, and I didn't realise the accident report. And they were they were just like making out that I was a criminal, and they put it was just written off, it was written over, and uh, they were heavy handed that the most important thing was for me to ring the insurance free. Now I know that night I watched a TV documentary, <laughs> coincidentally or not, I don't think it's a coincidence. It was on the BBC how the um, police are getting money, they're getting backhanders from if they get the insurance ticket free. In you know they get a cut in it. Now I, I don't, you know I'm not, I can't confirm that, but I can believe it. So that the police are encouraged only to, you know, it's like a bonus for them to get to the accident first. And I wondered why all these policemen turned up. A whole van turned up full of about six or seven policemen in it, like a minibus, another police car, and they were pulled up the road and pulled off the verge. And, and the person who took over the accident scene was literally up the road. And I thought, that's a bit strange. They, they were immediately at the scene as it happened. And I thought, oh, no, that's a bit odd. It was right outside my uncle's work. He was in the hospital that night. And, and the people who'd come across the road mentioned my uncle's name and I thought that was bizarre why did they mention my uncle's name and I said that's my uncle I was going to visit him tonight it was a, it was a really uh, you know like a, a demonically contrived uh, event and and and, I, and then I realised they, tam they tampered with my car rifled it and uh, and I wondered were they like um, reinstalling like the airbag because the airbag will go off at um, 30 mile in impact, both cars were right, right off. 
the, the car that hit me, the, the whole front of the engine compartment was crunched in and because I took my handbrake off it, it and my petrol tank was hanging off, all the back was pushed in, the back bumper had shattered and the bodywork was rubbing against the back wheels and the, and the police weren't even bothered about me, the only thing he was concerned is he just said uh, do that, ring the insurance as soon as you can and that was it and they left me there in shock and I was, and I said I can't, you know I couldn't drive and I wait I sat in the car in suck and I started to you know I, I was severely traumatized and it triggered a trauma so I received uh, extra in injury I, I I was almost bedridden for over a year um, one I got home that night and then the pain hit me and I and because of my past experience in the hospital that's the last place I wanted to go and if you if you know what I've been through believe you me you wouldn't want to go there either and um, so I, I, I just didn't know what to do um, and so that um, as I woke up I, I had such it's affected my um, further injury to my uh, frontal lobe so I've received real serious brain, brain bruising that's why I, I, I find it very difficult to articulate uh, and stutter and I miss things out of conversations and I uh, you know, I ran on and so that I'm trying to explain, so please be patient at what this video is about. And, and it, it's a continuing on of this um, dissociated trauma based conditioning and the handling and how you are handled when you're in that state and how easy it is to handle and cover up crimes and get away with it. And, and uh, it's not happened to me once, it's, it, it happens to me 99% of the time. Dentists, I've been abused in dentists, I've been abused in the doctors, I've been abused in hospitals and they basically can tell you to your face that what they're doing and they can get away with it. So I know there's people that know and they're looking out for people with um, what's that on my face? trauma based conditioning and so they can handle people. I've, I've heard of um, people in secret societies having this knowledge and how to um, handle handle a trauma based conditioning victim uh, and if you look into the trauma based condition it's either sexual abuse or narcissistic abuse or whatever that tickles that person's fancy and you're the victim and you're a target and you're on a target list and you don't really realise that until it's happened not once and not twice but it's consistent through school through everything and you go hang on a minute something not right here and, and you're kept down in this passive, oh, you know, nothing's going right for me, you know, and then you experience all this electronic harassment, voice to skull, and then you're not getting treated, you know, and it's all seemed to be a stage. Well, that's the world, it's the devil who runs this world, and he controls the people who are absent of uh, any, any compassion, or they're just hardened in their sin, and their unbelief, and their wickedness, and this behaviour is just natural behaviour. So this is the sort of thing I, I've encountered all my life. So uh, can, as I woke up, I, I couldn't remember uh, the day before. I couldn't remember anything. I suffered for about two years um, with short-term memory. So, and I had short-term memory problems, but and frontal lobe executive um, executive dysfunction which is the, uh, your frontal lobe is like your processor and, and orchestra, uh, the conductor of your brain, it's the thing that communicates your brain and all, keeps it all fluently and organised. So when that's damaged, you're like a, a spluttery computer, and with the car accident and the bruising of the brain, and not, not receiving treatment for that, it, it's be, become worse. So I, I was a little bit more dam damaged, so thank thank the Lord I, I've at least managed to uh, recover and I, and on this video there's going to be clips and you'll see me quite animated because it, I, I've been you know this wonderful day I've been um, traumatised and I'll, I'll explain what, what this video is about in a second but I just want to frame some context and to uh, just explain my difficulties so people weren't going to you know People that are potentially switch off may not switch off because they're like, oh, what's he waffling on about? Because I do waffle, 
and I, you know, it's hard to think, it's hard to fluently, you know, na people naturally just like, um, you know, a block of butter and a, a hot knife, you know, but for somebody who's got a trauma based injury or um, whether that's, um, a, a, you know, like a physical abuse trauma or, you know, you've hit your head or it's um, violent trauma, sexual trauma, it basically has a, a similar effect. So I've had the or organic damage and that started in my mother's womb. And um, I can only hypothesise what, where, where, where we've been, where my family was lied to, and with my actual event of my birth, I recoiled finally in the womb, and I was blue, I was suffocating, and my mum had such a job it put her off having any more children. She said it's such a nightmare, and I never really got to the bottom of well, did my I, I discovered some research that. Um, Women at that time were given um, fluoride tablets, and that will cause um, like a, a chemical lobotomy. Really, uh, fluoride will deteriorate the brain cells. Um, abusing drugs will do the same thing if they're dirty. You know, like uh, not na not so much natural drugs, but chemical drugs, they, and uh, they will burn your your brain. Um, lots of things do. Uh, the chemicals they put in cigarettes do that, but it, it's over a long, 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 long uh, consistent abuse. It will cause that um, frontal lobe damage and, uh, and deterioration of your your processing. <coughs> so I, it, on, it, I, I received further injury on on top of injury, and I'd get in the car and I couldn't remember getting in the car. So. That 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 was the end of my driving because I couldn't I couldn't go out on the road in in and I I had such an injured neck I couldn't turn my neck I can't put any weight on my head and I um I can't um supporting my head I have to use my muscles because all my tendons are damaged they are, they are stretched beyond you know one's tight and one's really floppy and, and my head will just wobble around like that. So I'm, I'm constantly keeping my head up with my muscles and that causes me tension and headaches. And my, I, I always feel like I've been hit on the back of the head with a sledgehammer because of the tension and the strain. And I've re been refused treatment and the uh, falsified report. And then looking back on it, I see it's control, it's conditioning, it's uh, behavioural conditioning, or whether it's ambiguous or whether that was uh, targeted. Now, my my opinion, it was targeted, and it, somebody put a price on me, and that was a whack. And my, they fixed my airbag, so when I didn't hit the airbag, my head, my neck should have snapped at that speed. Um, I've researched. Um, I was always interested in. Uh, Bracknell, where they research crash test dummies, which is just up the road from me. It's right near Broadmoor, uh, the hospital, or the um, the secure mental facility, and I've always had an interest in uh, accident research and uh, car safety and things like that. And um, so I knew a bit about um, injuries, and I saw um, a program on uh, in um, Indy 500 drivers how certain impacts will break the neck. Your head, there's even been car accidents where people's heads have come off, their necks have snapped and it's split the, it's removed the, the, the rip the skin at the back. It's like when they used to hang people, they had to drop them at a certain height, otherwise they, um, if they drop them too high, it, they, their head would come off. So they had to get the, the, the head, the height right, uh, enough to break the neck but not too much so that the body carries on going and it pulls the head off the shoulders. It's a very gruesome thought, I know. So forgive me for that. But um, I had a little understanding of uh, of injury and I was completely denied any treatment. I was handled by my doctor and I've been handled by my doctor from that particular surgery all my life. And uh, so Bill, continuing on, and still seeking care, not only from a trauma, because I've been kept from a diagnosis willfully and led up the garden path and, and, and given loads of false diagnoses, which I've never agreed to. 
and they've always it's always been written as fact and there's been um, false counsel and false reports medical reports when I've gone somewhere so you you really can't trust these people and um, I tried to overturn it but they, they, they refused and, and they threatened me on the phone um, and there's no trace of um, I've written and complained in a letter and requested for my medical documents rather than go you know rather than um, I just haven't had the energy. I've been fatigued for since my car accident, severely fatigued. I was burnt out when I was chasing after my mother, trying to get her out of hospital, going through the same sort of treatment. And this is you're starting to see this more commonly. People, you, you hear it on the news. People are experiencing this in more and more in hospitals. But this is not something surprising to me or new because I've been. There's been a a, a few people in human history that have always experienced this sort of treatment but now it's becoming more common cause it's sort of like ramping up the scale of the, the way they process people through the, through the wine press and it's how they get rid of that's how they slaughter off people and you know that's how it's designed to run and it gets ignorant people to do its bidding it's been designed to process people uh, to cull people to get rid you know to you think in the hospital how easy it is to say, oh, we can get away with this. Time and time again, lives slip through the net and they it, it, they become hardened in what they can get away with. And it, it's become quite brazen and they won't take responsibility. It's not their fault. It's, it's all the restrictions, it's all the money restraints. It's all that designed to overstretch the NHS, to milk it down with immigration. And you think of immigration, what's behind that that lie is um, a load of criminals that are planted, political immigrants are planted, organised gangs are set up, and uh, the wrong people are brought in on the back of that lie, oh, immigration's good for the country, but 99% behind that is the uh, dividing and the breaking up of our society and burdening our system and, and bringing it to its knees. That's what we're going for at the moment. That's what all this Brexit is, so we're getting ready for the next phase. So if, you, if you're a conscientious, caring person, you know, you've got, everybody's got a responsibility to do what's right. Um, so my the only thing you can do really the best thing you can do is is lay hold of your salvation I am a born again Christian and I know I've received the love of my saviour and it's a personal relationship through faith alone you do not need religion you do not need an advocate you just need to seek the Lord believe and take what he's done for you on the cross and when you receive what he achieved through his death, burial and resurrection, you'll feel the most wonderful love and joy that you could ever, you could ever imagine. And you would desire that your worst enemy does not die out on salvation. So if you're listening to this, you're, the most important thing you can do is save yourself. You might not, your family might not want to be saved. But the question you've got to ask to is, do you want to miss out? Because God is just. He's such a loving, merciful, long-suffering, beautiful, precious God. If you reject him, he's got no choice but to reject you and you'll die in your sin. And you'll be lost. And I can't cope with that. I can't cope with the thought of any soul being lost. I really can't. And you would know about what I feel if you, if you were saved, if you were born again. So my, my outreach to you, because you may never see me again, I could be dead, you know, and I don't, I don't, my life's not important. It, it, if, you're, if you're not saved, once you're saved, you're, you've received eternal life. You've been taken into heaven, and your spirit is in heaven while you remain in your sin, in your fleshy body, and you have the Lord's spirit and forgiveness and mercy and his grace and the Holy Spirit, and you're... you're, you're you're in a heavenly place it's imputed into your life and you've got that relationship it's not about religion organized religion is a cloak it's a counterfeit it's a robbery you just need to lay hold of jesus christ by just simply seeking him and believe and then you will know and that's that's the most important thing you can do in your life and that's what i want that's why i'm sharing these videos not for not for my benefit, not for glory, but for the reaching out to 
you know, people in the world and, you know, the world needs saving. And if you want to remain ignorant and sinful, sin is unbelief and sin will lead to death and hell. Hell is misery, suffering. It's all that Christ put off in the, in the grave. And he's pure, holy and he come up with sinless because he went into the grave sinless. He's eternally sinless. He's perfect. And he come, Jesus Christ come in as a, as a man. But he was fully God and fully man and he, he suffered our sins. So he could re, uh, redeem us. He could um, in, intercede and be an advocate to the judge, the Father. And the Father is holy and he won't suffer any sin in his kingdom. You need to be washed in the holy precious blood of the Lord. And if you're not, you'll die lost. And it's simple as that, believe. So if you're seeking answers, you need Jesus Christ, there's nothing else. Otherwise you're going to get wrapped up in the what's coming, what's up the road. And you don't want to be, you don't want to go through that period. That's a, we're, we're coming to a period in life where it's going to be rough. It's going to be rough for God. He's going to take so, it takes so much, he's outstretched so long, and then he's going to judge the world in one, in seven years. And there'll be a build up and then smack. And you'll be deceived by the world leader and all the conspiring powers that are in active force today. They're all out. They're all out to smash independence, law, freedom, the family, and they want control. These are sick devils. These are people that are possessed. And if you can't see that, you are so dumb in your sin. You're so lost. You're so dead. You're so dead inside that you need life. And the only way to life is through Christ. So this video is briefly uh, just an ongoing abuse in my life, and um, I don't want to go to I don't want to go to law with the, with the world. Uh, all I all I wanted was a bit of support and understanding and and, and some help to protect my rights could be in a trauma based condition because it. it it's unbearable. You're permanent. I'm triggered by the internet. I'm triggered by lies. You know, it, it, I don't like the internet. It, it just, um, it's just so wicked. It, it, churn, it makes me churn. It's so divisive. Um, and there's so many things that keep me in that trauma. And and the worst thing is liars who are professional. And so I've encountered these people who will lie to cover their own own ends really at your expense and that that is common practice they'd rather they'd rather see someone trod down in the street than face the consequences of what they're trying to cover up and there is a conspiracy there's a conspiracy in heart and there's an organized conspiracy of evil evil people a bodily of evil people trying to win power trying to win control and this is what this video is about now i um my brother was uh, ritually now now when I say ritually sacrificed it's a ceremonial people like to um, live out ceremonies in with public people now I, I feel on my in my life someone's claimed me as their property and they've been targeting me since birth and my life's been mapped out uh, not perfectly, but those people net me in my life, and I, I've experienced that through many avenues. So, what this video is about was just one day of that continuation, and um, I've been struck off many doctors with lies. I've I've had false reports written about me, and there's false counsel, so I'm always met with bias. And because you're traumatized, and you've got no you know, I'm barely no mates, I've got no friends, I've got, no, you know, uh, my family aren't able to deal with it and and, and, and it would be more of a hindrance because they don't understand and they can't comprehend it, so it just causes more problems. So, um, I wanted to, um, I, don't, I don't know really how I was going to go about it, but I always had it in the back of my mind that I wanted I wanted to uh, get get the answers and justice for my brother, and uh, he had a. I think he had a stage car accident. He broke his tibia and fibula in his arm, uh, broke his jaw, and uh, he was in a right mess. And that's not a nice thing to see. And uh, I, when I visited him in the ward after he'd been pinned back together, 
Um, I noticed his eyes were rolling and I turned up early out of visiting hours and uh, his eyes were rolling and I, I was trying to call the nurse's station to his attention but they deliberately ignored me and I couldn't quite, I, I, I couldn't, I disassociated, I couldn't handle it and I was only 16, 17 and I was on my own and then I started shouting, why aren't you helping my brother, why aren't you helping my brother and they walked past me twice. And my brother was literally pulling his, suffocating and he was pulling his clothes off. His eyes were white in his head, rolling in his eyes. And I said, why don't you, and, and they, they panicked. They didn't know quite what, oh, you know, I walked in on something. And I was thrown out of the ward by um, an officer and a crew of people that turned up on the ward. And they, they said, you, you got to get out of here now. And I went home. And, but on the way home, they'd phone my mum up and my dad and said, oh, you know, Mark's gone into intensive care. So that, that, that set my mum and dad off. So when I explained what I'd witnessed, it in the heat of the moment, they, you just can't take it in. And my mum suffers from disassociation and so does my dad. And uh, when you're put into a situation, you naturally disassociate and, and the only people you've you're forced to trust, you've got to go along with what's provided and um, so that went under the radar, it didn't quite sink in and then some, then we were waiting outside ICU, I went home and then when we went back and I went, went to ICU, we was waiting outside to scrub up and then this uh, guy come up to us, because it's a military hospital, they're all in uniform uh, there are a few civil nurses or, or in civil nurses' clothes, but most of them are in military dress. You know, the the women. Uh, I think they have a red band and they have a grey shirt and the, the 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 khaki dress and the buckle and the the shoes and the socks. And the officers have the uh, greens and whites and the uh, and their, and their their belt and and their hats and that. And it's all rank rank and file. And uh, this guy comes shaking up to us and he's trying to tell us something and this, his officer caught him um, effing at him, you get at maggot, and he, 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 he nearly collapsed and he turned around and marched up to the officer and he, 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 he marched into his office which was about uh, 50 metres, a really long corridor. They were at the end of the corridor in the office at the end. And we heard the door slam and all this abuse going on, this screaming at him. And we, we, we couldn't take it all in. What was he trying to tell us? And then there's all these other devices. And anyway, the result was my brother died. But my brother was next to another bloke with exactly the same injuries. And that bloke worked at where I worked. His, fa his father worked uh, right above me. He's right in the office above me. It's it, no coincidence. And there's this uh, ritual sacrifice, my brother and him, and they both die. And, and uh, my mum, they dropped a, a lie so we wouldn't talk to them. They said, oh, Mark's going to live, but uh, Richard's not. And, that, and, that, uh, and that, that was to keep us from talking with the, with the family, but it didn't work. And so that was a way of controlling the circumstances so you wouldn't talk about any suspicions and they could keep it under wraps. So there was, if you think of Jesus on the cross, Jesus didn't have his legs broken because he died, he gave up the ghost and he had a spear through his side and the water come out. But the two thieves were hanging on, they had their shins broken with a club and that the shock would kill them. So there's this living ritual sacrifice of my brother and Richard and it, it's a satanic, in, it's, an, it's a blasphemous insult. And we were, we were the components of this thing and it was all covered up. Uh, there was no police report, the police didn't take an accident report. They did from the driver and he was, and at the inquest he was advised to keep his mouth shut, not to be liable. And we had absolutely no support, no evidence and it was like, oh, accidental death, blah, 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 tick. And off it went. We were in complete shock. You, when you lose someone a family member, that's, that's your life, it shatters your life. So that's another trauma experience. So I've been having these ongoing trauma experiences all throughout my life. And, and that just makes you worse and worse and worse and worse and you become such a nervous wreck. 
you can't cope. You're like my nerves are like um, a World War Two shell shock victim, and you go beyond the stage where you can't stop shaking. You're permanently shaking inside, and it, it you know it, it's impossible to live with. And you're a victim of all this abuse, whether by ambiguous uh, design or uh, and natural behaviour, or whether by calculated, pinpointed. Uh, machinations. You're part of um, looking into satanic rituals. You're you're you see the esoteric symbology and and the moving of Satan through these people. This demonic force through people. It's sort of like a power. It's like a, a demonic power that people worship and they get off on. It's their god. Lucifer is their god. The devil, Satan, is their god. And these are their offerings. But they do them publicly because it has power. It's a spilling of blood. It's, it's taking life to um, gratify their uh, vain ambition and uh, we were part of it. That's completely written over and on it, on, on it goes. So get into the video today. Um, I thought the time's come, or I'm, I, I need to report this. I've been putting it off and I wanted to make a full police report and I thought, well, which way round shall I do it? Shall I go and get try and get legal advocacy? Because I'm so tired and my brain, I'm, it's such a struggle just to get through the day and concentrate. It's, they're just monumental tasks I can't possibly achieve on my own, and I haven't got anyone available to to take my hand and advocate for me, and that's all I need. And then I I can do it, but I've got that backup. I've got that person there to. But, you know, finding a person like that is, uh, you know, almost impossible because, A, they, they would need to be a born-again Christian and, B, they got, you know, realistically, they'd have to have the time. It's just not realistic. So I, I've been putting it off and I was looking into the law that uh, serious crimes like that, there's no statutory limit on when you can report them. But the trouble is the evidence is, is diminished. Um, my mum's death was covered up and these are the things I wanted to report and this is what this video is leading to. So, um, I wanted to make a report but I didn't quite know how to do it and, and I thought, I, I, and I didn't want to really put it off, I just couldn't approach it and I didn't know how to approach it so I was just waiting for the Lord. And, and if I tried to make it happen it wouldn't so I, I just had to you know, go to day to day best as I can while I'm being targeted, while I'm being traumatised and while I'm being abused and while all that abuse has been written off as it never happened. So um, if you can get, if that if that can sort of bring some context into the, because um, I've calmed down now and I've I sort of like watched what I've, I've written. Now what, what, what contains in the video is basically my testimony of this last night and today and how I approach dealing with it officially with the law and uh, I've rec I, um, I, 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 I'll, get, I'll get into it in a minute but I've got three voice recordings two of my journalising the experience because I couldn't I didn't couldn't quite figure out whether I could record the phone conversation I've got no equipment to record phone calls um, so I used a dictaphone on the, on the last call, but the first two calls were, were unsuccessful, so I thought, oh, re-evaluating what, what had just happened, and I couldn't believe what had happened, and it happened three strikes in a row. So I didn't have any expectations, I thought I'd go through this patiently. So when I, you'll see a video clip coming up, and, and this is the context, of what happened to in this day, this morning and um, last night. So I had a temperature and I got a rash and I thought, right, I, I need medical assistance. This is serious and, and, and usually I just ignore the seriousness and I'd have got ill and died. So I thought, right, I, ne I need to address this and, and get healthy. But I can't go into the hospital where my mum was abused and kicked round the ward and written up as it was all hunky-dory. That the sun shines out of their portholes, you know, and, and the golden NHS. The NHS is like a combine Arthur star, and it and it'll run over ninety percent or eighty percent, and that'll be the fallout. And you dare say anything against the NHS? It's like immigration, you know. All the, and I'm not 
I know there's some wonderful people in the police, in the ambulance, in the military, in the, you know, even in the government, in the royal family. You know, in all avenues of life, you've got some good-hearted people. You know, people to who want to do right, and they're, you know, they're conscientious. So it's not the people necessarily; it's the people who control the people and regulate the people, and those people are raised ignorantly and they're obedient to and they don't question and they've been trained and they're, and then you get professional pride and it's all reinforced so if you speak out against the NHS you slap down you see because it can't do no wrong it's a wonderful NHS and the people are wonderful in it but amongst it you've got some dirty evil people and I've seen it first down in Cambridge Military Hospital where my brother was killed and bumped off and, they, and when that closed down those people went into the hospital where my mum <laughs> where my mum was abused and treated and, and it you know it never happened and my mum was my mum paid for a, to be buried with my brother and at the time of her funeral the local St John's Church in our parish denied that uh, my mum see I got the certificate somewhere but you're going through all that I was so fatigued I had to chase my mum get my mum out of hospital then I had to look after on my own 24 hours a day because cause they, they wouldn't let her out. They'd already signed a death warrant. So with the help of Jesus Christ and the grace of God, and, and I fought it, and, and she was released. But I knew, and my mum knew, that she wasn't coming out, and they signed a death warrant, because they didn't treat her. She had a wound about that big. And from the day she went in there, they, they didn't even treat it. They didn't, they didn't bandage it. I found my mum kicking her teeth around the room, her bandages all off and dirty. They hadn't been changed for about three days. She went from one ward to another and they just kicked the can down the road and they sit there going, what do you want us to do about it? All in my face, you see. Now, I've got no proof of that because I was on my own. They knew I was on my own and they more than likely knew I was traumatised and I disassociate in that circumstance because you experience that. You, sh you know, it's very hard to assert yourself. Even with prayer and, and faith, it is very tiring. It's very tiring to get up and live through the day. And, and you can only really, realistically do so much. And that, that's my life. Thank God for it. You know, I, I've got nothing to be ungrateful about ever, whatsoever. You know, I'm very thankful for, for life, full stop. And all that goes with it, you know, rain, shine. It, and the sun, you know, the sun shines on the righteous and the wicked. And good people experience some really horrible things. And it's usually the bad people that get away scot free. So if that's any comfort to you, I hope I hope it is. So with all this experience, I didn't want to go into that hospital and um, and face those people because I'm really frightened of just doing them over. But you know, the Lord's avenging such things, and I and I leave it to Him. But you know, I really am angry. And I really could crack out. And because I was traumatised at two, I was a very passive, gentle, meek little child. And I inherited that from my dad. My mum's very fiery. You know, she, she, won't, she won't take any... She never took any... Any muck from anyone. She called a spade a spade. And she, she could call, she'd call people out and tear them to pieces. You know, my mum's very assertive. And thank God I got that, but my dad's very passive, and he's all but he's very gentle, but he's very he's disassociated like I as, and I, I didn't really realise it. So it's very easy to handle people like that, keep them under wraps, and they just can't function to stand up to abuse. They might do when they get home and think, well, why on earth didn't I do something? And that's that's deliberate. That's a natural reaction. So when I was traumatised. It's fight or flight. Now I done both. I thought the fir my first reaction was to go at back at my granddad when he flipped me, and he threw me right across the glass. And, I, and the only thing that stopped me was the friction. And I rolled across all this glass, and all my I was just lacerated with all these fine cuts. And it just what tra what traumatised me was seeing my own blood, and I was covered in I was like a red red dip, dipped in the pot of paint. And I, I had that memory, but I had no association to that memory in my life until I was 38. And my mum was carrying all the guilt. And the three people involved with that, I, I believe, were managed because they knew this, uh, the people involved, or the devil, or however it was orchestrated, 
would have been psychologically profiled, so they knew how the family would deal with that action. They would want to keep it under wraps. Uh, my nan would want to protect my father. My mum was abused by her father and uh, frightened, and uh, my mum had to stand up to her dad. And so my mum got me out of the situation, and it was never, she never even told my dad. My dad would have called the police or more than likely killed her father. You know, my dad, he, my dad was passive, but if you push him, you know, he wouldn't want to get in his way. And so I was kept under wraps, and that, then I realised, looking in hindsight, that that continued. So I, I, I thought, well, this must be orchestrated. And then I started researching and seeing how it is orchestrated and how it was done to satanic families. So then I could realise the, 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 the exact so association to what I was experienced, but not, not in a direct family, it was more indirect on our family, we were like pieces to play with by this net around our uh, compromising our family probably with blackmail or guilt or something they've done or, or they've been trauma based condition in their lives so it continues and this has followed our family lines, both of our family lines, I can see it in my dad's and I could go into it for a long time but I won't and my mother's, so my first reaction was fight but then my then, 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 then my granddad just burst into a rage, and I, that's when I shattered. And then um, I managed. I, I was literally um, in such a state when my mum found me. I was just like dripping with blood. And I got away from my granddad by the grace of God, because I I can't remember. I can remember that point, and then I was standing, in right in the middle of the road in the close and that was like it was almost like a translation it was almost like in a blink i was over over 200 meters away and my granddad had to run all the way back round to where he was to catch me and he he arrived at me as i was screaming and calling out, i was shouting on the rooftops granddad done this to me and i was i was just literally red in blood and my mum come up met my granddad as my nan come out to see what all the hollering was about and, and my mum looked at my nan gave her a look of recognition and my mum snatched me put me in a pushchair and was gone now I shut down that memory completely and it didn't come out to 38 years later so looking back in hindsight I, I had to piece the dots together and I could only do that by by others experience and, and, and my faith in Christ and what he afforded me to be able to cope with what I'd experienced and he, he was able, able to lift me out of the, uh, you know, he'd, he'd come close when I needed him most. And I also experienced that sort of love and that grace and that completeness when I was an infant. When when I woke up in the morning I, I, I used to have um, repercussions of the trauma, my, my legs would just collapse and I couldn't get off the floor, I was just jelly and I couldn't work out what was going on because I, I disassociated compartmentalised the trauma and I couldn't work out and I was only three, four and certain things would trigger me and I'd just go flop like a bit of plop on the floor just like a cow pat and then I'd have to recover myself and I couldn't figure out what it was and other times I'd be like like I was to my granddad on your bike. So I had this uh, sort of beast put inside me by by that experience. That made me a very angry person. But I wasn't predominantly angry, I was predominantly gentle, like my dad, and patient. Very patient, very you know, very uh, empathetic. The black sheep if you like. And uh, the youngest. And um I realised that I had trauma based disassociation after my mum died and I realised that she was carrying a lot of guilt and she was getting it off her chest and then it all come, it all fell into place, oh you're carrying this guilt and so we resolved that guilt, thank the Lord my mum was saved and on it went. So last night I thought you know, with that carrying all this all through my life, thinking, how am I going to go to the police? You know, you're going to be put down. I've got no witnesses. All the, all the evidence is rewritten over. I've got false reports. I don't stand a chance. So I thought, I'm going to do this. I just don't know how. So I trust the Lord and 
day to day thing you know things evolve things change and so if you're experiencing giving up in life don't you know tomorrow could be a nice a wonderful day and the day after might be the worst day of your life but you know you will get through it so don't give in and say being targeted in this home and being burnt out from getting my mum out of hospital then they moved her into they they when when I got my mum home, all they wanted to do, my mum knew it, is they wanted to get into into a it's called Phyllis Tuckwell, which is a charity associated to the NHS, run by owned by the charity but run by loads of soppy, kind, caring people, you know, really good caring people, but they're all a bit cotton wool, all lovey dovey sort of thing, and they don't really see the orchestration in it. Well me, me and my mum had experienced it and it was brazen in our face. My mum was a uh, cable tied to her bed. They weren't treating her. My mum knew it, but my mum couldn't speak, and they'd written her off as a psychiatric idiot. So, as far as the hospital concerned, from the beginning, that they'd killed her, or they planned to kill her, and they they sectioned her, but they never told me because they wouldn't let me speak to the head and the consultant. And I trained with nurses, so I knew that they didn't have that people on the ward ain't going to tell you anything. So all the time I was demanding to see the head of my mum's care to get to the bottom of it and meet them, but they kept stringing me up the road. And that, that was keeping me away from my anxious mum, stuck in this uh, unable to speak and being treated like this. My mom, so all my energy was really focused on, on my mum and getting her home. And eventually I did. But it, it, it follows, you see, they, they tried to uh, stop her coming out and when I got her out, all they wanted to do was get her into Phyllis Tuckwell and eventually my mum realised we're not going to win and she, she, that's when she had a change of heart and she thought, I'm just going <laughs> to... She said, admirably, she said, you know, I've had enough, I'm going to turn her, excuse me, turn her face to the smiters and she just admirably they, they bumped her off and you know they they they, they, they made out it was um, a brain tumour but what it was it was they, they knocked her off because they were trying to cover up that my mum had a serious infection and the, the actual Phyllis Tuckwell documented she had a serious infection in the hospital she did nothing wrong with her all the, all the uh, palliative care team, nothing wrong with her, and they lawfully were obliged on condition. I had to stick to all the lawful conditions to get my mum out. All the requirements, I met them. They didn't keep one of their lawful requirements. They didn't bandage my mum. They lied. They got me out of the room. My mum's leg it was only her thigh, and the way they'd get me out of the room so they could conceal the infection, because I could tell, I know what an infection looks like. But she had a full bandage with like tape and, and lint and so I, I could never see the wound so that the nurses were coming they're supposed to come in every day they come in every other day and all they're doing is bandaging up an infection I heard the doctor on the phone refuse her antibiotics and that's my mum's GP I took my mum to the GP Dr Fairburn Dr Olive Fairburn and she when what do you want me to do about it? My mum's fame was like bloated and Dr Fairburn was the emergency doctor and she also knew what was causing that because my mum had stents and she was on a, a blood thinning drug and that was the problem so rather than take rushing my mum to hospital in hindsight what I should have done I took her to the one who's ahead of her care and that was the do her GP which is my GP which is my father's GP and then she went, what do you want me to do about it? And I just thought, took my mum and took her home. And then my mum's leg burst, her, her artery or vein burst. And it caused a venous wound that you could get your fist in it. And they, they decided they weren't going to treat it. They stopped her drugs and then, and then thought, oh, we'll kill her off. You know, we ain't going to bother doing it. And she got an infection. And I personally believe they gave her the infection. Because these, these are psychopaths. And he's working in, in the NHS hospital among all the good people and all the public people. And these are organised. So beware. And that's why people don't come out of hospital and wonder why what should be done isn't being done. And it's orchestrated to put such a strain on the NHS. It's, it's easier to justify it. Oh, it's the, 
it's the cuts, you know, it's not our fault. You know, it's all it's all lies. And when you've experienced it first hand, you see it, you don't need anyone to tell you otherwise. And so uh, I heard the doctor refuse the um, her medication and uh, so we knew that they were just trying to kill her and then eventually they killed her off. They um, uh, it, and then it follows through to the uh, Church of England, the uh, denying that my mum had a burial plot. So I didn't have the energy or time to rummage through all our paperwork to find my mum that that bit of receipt to say that my mum had paid to be buried with her elder son, who was also buried at that churchyard. So that I tweeted today and I thought, well, of course I wanted to cremate my mum. So there's no evidence, you see. You can't do an autopsy. And so that's how you, you're kept under wraps, by these little devices and tricks and then writing over that that didn't happen or putting this happen instead of that. And if, you're not, if you've got no support and no one to back you up, you can't, even if you, I stand up to myself, but they would just look at you coldly and, and, and turn their back on you. I walked into the ward one day, my mum's bandage was all unwrapped, all her leg was in. I could see she had a urine infection as well, a bladder infection, and they weren't treating her for it. And I wanted to pick them up on it, and I, I wasn't aggressive. I just walked up to this sister and said, what's going on with my mum? Why aren't you treating her? She turned around, walked through a door that I couldn't follow. And that's how they treated me. And I had to get my mum out. When I got her out, they, they just wanted to bump her off. And lawfully, you have to take the people into your home. And... Um, because of the treatment, you see, so I was, they had my arm behind the back, and we knew that, what they were up to. My poor old dad, he can cope with it, and he, he, he never saw, he, he disassociated. My dad can't even remember where he was when I was born. He can't even figure out why he can't remember, and why the person who did abuse me was there. And, and, and then I'm starting to see how it's orchestrated and, I, and I'm questioning this hypothesis, that hypothesis and, and, and to be honest I haven't got the answers, I've just got the fruit, I've got the experience and the hindsight and I can, I'm still trying to piece it together. So I thought how do I get all this out? Well last night, now I've had this temperature for a long time and it's not, it's not always ill, it's, it, it's um, if you look at covert uh, stealth weapons and how they work, one of the techniques is to pulse you at a certain frequency and what that does is that heats up your core body temperature to 37 degrees, that's roughly what the temperature I was last night. That, that stops your body from resting and being out of cope and you will burn out and I'm kept in that permanent state and plus there's sounds you see but last night it was I knew it was a fever because usually I'd go out of my room and I and I and if I'm on the move you, I stop being cooked but when I'm sitting down in the spot that I'm a sitting duck and I'm targeted when I lay down that's when I start sweating I can have the window open it's frosty I can't, as soon as I get under the covers, you just burn. So you take the covers off, you start getting chilly. But you're cooking inside, they raise your core body temperature up, your brain fries, and, you, and you're in a constant state of agitation. Then they try another trick to, to get you to react. So they're trying to keep you angry to react. Then they send someone, you punch or something. Thank God I haven't done that. I, you know, but I do, I have sworn, I, you know, I've hit my dad a few times because I... I just, it's just unbearable and um, I felt really upset that my dad was just in such denial of everything and my poor and what they're trying to do is get me to get in such a rage and probably murder my dad and so I had to a, a few times the lids come off and my dad's a, he is a selfish man and, and um, he's also an alcoholic and so I had to get all that out of, out of his life and I had to take control but he's such a stubborn, and he lies, you see, so, you know, thank God things are a bit different today, but that's, that would be my flashpoint. So I'd, I'd experience all this agitation flash, and one day he blasphemed, so I, I, I gave him a, like, knock in the guts, don't, don't blaspheme my Lord, and I just felt so ashamed, and I thought, you know, Dad, I'm really sorry, I'm such a shame. And then I'm calling them all the names under the sun and I take all my frustrations, because you do, you take all your frustrations out and the ones you love. So I was cussing at him, you know, I'm trying to 
overcome addictions, you know, thank God I've got, uh, you know, all drugs out of my life, and drink, I don't drink, um, I have had a drink today, I must admit, I was in such a state, I had a little, a little bit of rum, uh, but that's not something I, I'm going to do and want to do, if I, if I had some heroin, I'd have done it, if I had some Valium, I'd done it, but those things I'd be addicted to, so, um, I'm not going to go down any slippery slope, and, and the one thing I really struggle with is smoking, so, because uh, I'm always such a nerve, and it's a co it's really a coping thing, and I'm not justifying smoking, smoking is bad for you, you know, it's not good for your health, but um, I, I, I do know the machinations of tobacco, so I try and, you, I'm, I'm not saying to, this tobacco is right, I can't use puffers, but, um, I smoke the pure tobacco with no additives, but that's very difficult. You, you need to, you, you won't get that, you, you won't find it in the shops. You've got, you've got to know that it's there, and, and therefore you've got to know all the other manufacturer stuff's poison. They had so many chemicals to it, and then they tell you you're going to get cancer. But, but there's certain tobaccos that then there's no additives, there's no antifungicides, so they are a little healthier. And that, that's what I've always smoked, just for my nerves and, and as a coping thing. Like uh, people with autism, like routine and, and, and mundane things for a sense of normality. It's just a coping tool. And because and I've got an addictive personality, that's one of being the hardest things just to, you know, flick. And I have, I've been completely, when I was saved, I was completely washed. I didn't, I didn't want to do anything, you know, none of that stuff. I, I wanted rid of all, those, all that stuff, I've been, you know, hooked to it all my life, you know, so, uh, I'm getting very emotional, forgive me. So, um, you know, uh, so I had, a, I had a drink just to calm down, so the video, you, were, the clips you're about to see of me very animated, there's three, um, so last night I had the temperature and I noticed I had all these blotches and I filmed the blotches in the video so I won't get my uh, legs out. Um, I've done a video. So the video you're about to see is a brief testimony of what I've just explained and the context and all the, uh, the rash and infection on my leg. I went onto the NHS website and done a symptom check and it said, I've got, I've got all, it's very painful, I'm fatigued. And I've had all this uh, stealth weapons and this cooking and all this other stuff. If you research um, non-lethal weapons, uh, covert stealth weapons, or V2K, voice to skull, I've, I've had all that. I've had, you know, um, so many different devices used against me to keep me in, to, uh, in junction with this trauma-based conditioning. It's a part of the toolkit that they use on you, and they get it's getting more advanced and they get there's so many different people involved and I, I don't know who it is you don't see it you're just on the end of it and you can speculate it's this people it's that people you know i've stood up to so many corrupt people uh corrupt housing association corrupt council and i've given my testimony and you know called them out and then you'll get you'll get this abuse of the mormon church the catholic church organized religion um that you know the apostasy, the heresy, and they pay people to go and get you. You know, I've had, we've had criminals sent around to rough, ruffle our family up. We've had 40 people surrounding our house giving us abuse. You know, you really, unless you touch on someone's toes, you ain't going to experience this sort of um, repercussions. And, and, it, and if you don't stand up for yourself, you're going to remain a doormat and you're going to get swept up in it you will get sifted so it's better to do it's better to stand up and you know say no and do the best you can and lay down and do nothing so i thought oh now i, I thought i can't because of I've, I've improved coping with uh not realizing serious seriousness I, I i before i i can look at all my legs and they they've got all scar all these fine scars all the way up them all up my chest, all up my arms, and I've been looking at them all my life, but not associating to what they are. So usually, when something's wrong with me, I don't realise the seriousness of it. I discount it. My lamb claps, I didn't really. I was a bit disassociated from the seriousness, and it took me a, it took me a long time to realise I need to go to the hospital. I just thought, uh, I, I just, I was just locked in a state 
of coping with it, and I didn't, I couldn't quite associate to the seriousness of it. And then, then um, I knew I was going to die. And then, then, then the Holy Spirit kind of prompted me. Well, what do you want to do? Do you want to die or do you want to live? And I thought, oh, oh well, I want to live. I don't want to die yet. And he said, well, and the Holy Spirit prompted me to get to hospital. So I jumped out of the bath with a collapsed lung. I couldn't breathe. <coughs> couldn't breathe. And I'd been in the bath. Uh, I'd been up with a collapsed lung. This was about three in the afternoon. I had a bath in the afternoon. And I got up quite early with this collapsed lung. It happened in bed. And so I didn't realise the seriousness of it. And it was like last night. I f I was looking at this rash and thinking I was brushing it off and I thought no, septicemia, I might have, I just might have an infection from my bad teeth, I might have a, um, a blood infection from uh, internal injury, um, you know, it's not only my neck that was injured, it was my back, my ribs, and my shoulder and all, all, all the cartilage, all the tendons and my throat, I might have gained an infection. And I thought, oh, I've got a po I've got blood poisoning. Have I been spiked? Has someone tricked? Is this a virus? Is this, um, I thought, oh, I wonder if it's um, measles, you know, um, shingles. But it's not painful, it's just blotchy. And I thought, oh, that's pretty serious. I better check out the symptoms before I decide what I'll do. So I went to 111 on the website and I filled out the details. All my symptoms have got uh, almost like, I think it's deep frame from, from, from braces because I've not been able to exercise so much, so I think that's been consequential. My my mum used to suffer this, your your veins snap in your fingers and it's painful to walk on my feet and I couldn't, if I hold a door handle it's very painful and my grip, my, it's painful to grip as well. Uh, and so with those symptoms, with the fever, I checked my temperature, it was like, um, at highest it was about 97 and, and, and then I, I carried on measuring it and it, was consistent, it didn't drop below 95 for over t about 48 hours and I thought oh, I started to twig it, oh this is serious and, and I thought oh this is not, when I saw the rash I thought oh this is not the usual cooking, this is both perhaps and um, and to be honest, a lot of the electronic targeting had stopped. So I've got a meter. They've either changed frequencies, and my meter doesn't pick it up. And uh, the uh, the old stuff was the three G stuff, which they fire through the wall. Modern modern five G doesn't go through walls so so well, but it can go through windows. And that's why they've got loads of antennas for five G because it's a different frequency and it operates a different way. Where where the old three G, they could fire it through through the wall. And it was maintain half of its strength at the target. So if you've got, if you've had a point cloud, you put um, from your Wi-Fi, it will map outline of what it passes through. So if it passes through any water or inanimate objects, it will, uh, that can be pinpointed and mapped on a computer. So if you've got a device that can like record and uh, plot what the uh, radiation is doing, you've got like an X-ray, and that's what. Um, pin cloud, point cloud is. That's what 5G is going to do. It's good. you're going to have like a rad a constant 3D radio image. So if you you know infrared, like the, where they can see black and white, thermal white, and they can see through walls where the heat signature is. It's a bit like that, like an X-ray. So they can see where you are in your room, and then they can target where you are. And if they can get sound in, they can hear what you're saying, they can also see what you're doing. That just takes a, a burst of Wi-Fi, smart meter, any, or, they, or they can generate it themselves with energy. And um, I know that there's a helicopter pilots have got a device where uh, special forces that they can drop a little device with a parachute in the bush and it can, uh, it can fire a, a, a radio frequency into the house but it, it will also map what that like radar what it hits and it, and, it, and it plots it on a computer up in the, pot, in the helicopter's cockpit so they can launch this device stealthily outside your house, it could be parked in a car uh, they, please, um, they got this van where they can radiate your house and see everyone in their rooms. You may have seen the technology. Um, and some of the, uh, what are those uh, movement sensors on games? I'm not sure what they thought. They've got that capability if you've got the software or the hardware. 
So anything with um, radiation in your home is gonna, you're gonna be, uh, A, you're gonna absorb that ra radiation, and B, you're gonna be plotted, and potentially you can be uh, brought up on screen, on a computer screen, recorded and monitored so they can see into people's houses like they can see through walls like or watch people like fish tanks that's why they want to roll out 5g and so they can spy on people and you're in this you're in this prison virtual prison they can see everybody you can't see anybody and all the all the corrupt um infiltrated services in our country police whether that's the police military intelligence government are could potentially be participating in this and they're helping it and um, so I put in the symptoms I recognised that it's serious and I thought oh uh, I'm going to check that and, and I put all my symptoms of fatigue, the sweating, the temperature, the rash and the answer come up get to the emergency A, A, A and A and E immediately and I thought oh I'm not going tonight I can't go tonight oh see how I am in the morning and um, see if I can get some rest and see if the rash clears up, see if it gets any better, but it didn't. So I thought, right, tomorrow I'm going to ring the 111 and see if I can get a, 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 you know, a proper diagnosis, hence why I've done this video. So what I did is I rang 101 and on the phone it said, um, it, I will cover this again because I'm documenting what I've just experienced on the phone, so you're going to see uh, in succession, three phone calls. 101, uh, no, 111, I called, and then I'll tell you what happened. And then 101, I called, and I'll tell you what happened. And then I, I called 999, and then I'll tell you what happened. That's what this video is about, and I am going to publicly post it. So please, if you, you got this far, this is um, just a, a bit of evidence, and... Uh, testimony that I'd like to share publicly uh, just as a warning to the world and and just to protect my own safety and my father's you know because I'm not gonna lay down to these people I'm gonna stand up to them whether it, you know hook or bike or whether it kills me or not um, I, I'm gonna press forward so I thought I'm gonna document it so I phone 101 and it, when when you pick when when you've dialed the number it's it, it says if you don't want to give your details, you don't have to. And you can rena remain anonymous, but you had to tell the operator. Now, when the operator picks up the phones, you put on a hold and you're getting all the instructions. I said, I, now it says to mention it to the operator as soon as you speak to them. Uh, she said, oh, hi, it's Adrian. And I, yeah, Adrian, it's like a bloke's name, but it was a woman. She said, I'm, hi, I'm Adrian. I said, I said, hello Adrian, I said, is it right that I can, she says, oh, what's your, what's your date of birth? And I gave my date of birth, and she says, oh, what's your name? And I said, well, it, it did say at the thing that I could remain anonymous. She said, well, I've got to run through a triage of questions. And I said, yeah, but it said I can remain anonymous. I didn't want to give her the reason. I, it, you know, I, I just wanted to have those symptoms clarified that I checked online to check it with a human being because it says that they are qualified experts. I doubt, but, you know, not, they're probably under trained and they're not fully qualified, they're just trained. I don't know, but anyway, that's just a criticism. And I said, I'd like to remain anonymous. She said, well, I can't proceed because I've got to do a triage of questions. I said, well, could you tell me what contains it's contained in the triage of questions. He said, no, I can't until you give me your details. And I said, well, my problem is that um, I can't, I, I can't, I, I can't remember the exact words, but why I didn't want to give my details because there's falsified records on my medical report. So when another professional reads them, I don't know what is written. But what I have experienced that people react badly, so there's either false counsel or there's biased treatment I'm handled. So I said I wanted to remain anonymous. She said you, I can't proceed because I have to ask a triage of questions. And I said, well, 
Adrian, I just, I, it's just told me that I am entitled to withhold my details. And I said, I want to, now this, I had to tell her, I said, I want to withhold my details because there's been a crime, com, crime committed with my medical record. And I don't want, because I, I think, Adrian, that part of this triage is that it requires you to consult my medical document and I said I don't want my treatment biased so I would just like my symptoms checked please it's an emergency and and um, and it's 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 tied in with a crime and she said I cannot proceed she was going on her training I cannot proceed unless I go through a triage of questions I said I appreciate that Adrian but what could you can tell me what's in the triage of questions she wouldn't she wouldn't tell me what the triage of question is and i said well how you know i've been told one thing how how and i don't don't want to go through this tree i just ask you what the triage of question is and is it to do with consulting my medical record she wouldn't tell me she said i'm going to have to hang up the conversation so i'd explain the circumstances the criminality and the emergency she said if it's emergency ring 999 or go down to the hospital go and see your doctor and she hung up on me as i was saying well look i need help she went Bleh. and i thought oh right and then i was agitated and i quickly thought right i better document this while it's hot so that's the first recording i had my dictaphone on, on in my up, i run upstairs got my dictaphone put what my experience was calmed down a bit because i was agitated and triggered and i thought right i'm gonna call 101 I'm not going to go, I'm not going to see, get my symptoms confirmed, do it that way around. I'm going to go to the police now and I'm going to report this crime. And I thought, I want to speak to a detective or constable. And I know that 101 is a brush off. There's no constables. And then I rung 101. I got the same treatment. I said, I want to report a crime and it's associated to a medical ongoing abuse. And then again, I've blanked the details, I forgot, but I documented that. She said, oh, the conversation's being recorded on the, on the thing. And they said, oh, we can't help you. And I explained the circumstances. Well, how am I going to get... If there's a crime being against me, and that crime was committed in the hospital that I need to go to and I had no chance to explain all the other avenues that I've got no doctor and and there's some controversy with that when my mum died our doctor disappeared and we weren't notified that we changed our doctor as soon as I looked and discovered my doctor in another surgery I was looking into another surgery where I was struck off anonymously about a reason and the doctor disappeared and when I turned up to, for my follow-up appointment with this doctor, they said, she's left and we want you out of here. And we don't, and I said, well, why? What have I done? And they said, we don't have to give you a reason. Get out. And I got out. Right, so that was, a, that was two surgeries I'd been slammed out of. And I was bewildered by it. I thought, well, what am I, you know, I've got no, no, no medical. So I was about a doctor for a long time. But eventually I had to go back to the old doctor that had, um, abused me before who also sent me to Frimley Park Hospital to see a specialist, a psychiatrist before I sat down she was like abusing, you know, abusive and when I told her a bit of my life story oh you're a waste of space, get out of my office I reported that to my doctor they'd already had a chin wag and I said look I'm at the end of my tether I've just lost my brother I had this trauma based disassociation and post traumatic stress but I didn't know what it was so I was looking for a diagnosis of symptoms, but not they weren't recognising it, they were deliberately avoiding it and playing this game. She said, oh, if you feel like killing yourself, go and kill yourself, railway over there, look, get out. And she, and they had a conversation on the phone, so that's what met me, their conversation, so that was staged. And um, I, I lost it and spat in her face, I said, you wicked witch, you know, you wicked witch of the West. And I break down, uh, and then I went to this other doctor that, that I was struck off anonymously. And uh, when when I was in hospital with a collapsed lung and they refused to treat me, I added, and I was having an x-ray, I, I read my medical record of what that 
psychiatrist wrote about me. What a lovely, gentle person Andrew is. We're really concerned about him. Right, that's what they wrote. And, the, and that was over 20 years later. And uh, you can imagine the shock. And that's when I started to, it dawned, it dawned on me. You know, this is handled, this is controlled, this is... But I had no, no one to relate to. No, you know, you talk about it, people go, you're a nutter, you know, imagine it. Because they don't comprehend it, because they're not experiencing it. Only people who experiences experiencing it know what I'm on about, because they go through it all the time. And then I realised when I took my mum to the emergency doctor, that's exactly how the doctor was treating my mum. So as I learnt, going along learning, I'm learning my mum's trauma-based disassociation, getting the same treatment, we're targeted, the whole family is. So to address it, so when I was on this site looking for doctor, um, what I was going to do was, this was not, not long ago, about a year ago, two years ago, I was just looking around, A, for another do alternative doctor, well, considering it, and also I wanted that surgery because I wanted to go back and find out if there's any record of me ever being struck off or ever being there, and that, and that doctor, a Scottish young Scottish woman, where she went, and is she still there, or is there any record of being there? Because the current... I, and then, the day that I was on that site, some intelligence must have tipped the surgery off, and I discovered that the woman who... He, he, our doctor, who told my mum, and the one, um, uh, this is the doctor after the one with me in hospital. That was that doctor was Doctor Barrack, and then we had Doctor Fairburn. Doctor Barrack Barrett was the one that told me to kill myself, and then I reported her to another doctor, and she was struck off, but or well, she disappeared. I don't know if she struck off. And this young doctor put in a report and helped me. And when I went back, she'd gone. And I was told to get out of that reason. And then Dr. Barrack had gone, and then we got a new doctor. Now, we didn't get to choose our doctor. They're appointed to us. So after my mum died, and I was looking around at, at least two years after, I saw my doctor, Dr. Fairburn, at this surgery at the lower rung of the ladder. And I, and I put the two and two together, this is a manoeuvre, because they're, they're manoeuvring. They've either gotten rid of her because she's a liability, because they know what's going on. I got a letter, except from the time that I was on that website, I got a letter, at least two days, about a day, 24 hours later, in the post, saying, you, you, oh, we're sorry we haven't informed you about do your change of doctor, Dr Fairburn's no longer here. Well, I knew that already because I discovered at this other side. You've been registered to this new doctor, Dr Marshall. Now, I wrote a letter to refuse registration because I ain't going to put myself back in that. But my dad, like a, a robot disassociated, just filled it in and sent it off. I said, Dad, what have you done? And and then so so I was thinking oh right we need to undo that, but my dad has no association to what his wife went through or anything or what I'm going through. He's just completely shut down. He's a complete blockhead, and he can't he can't comprehend why he's like that. And he's always had my mum to depend on, and and he's been out of function. And he was like that at work for his adult life. She's disassociated. He's shut down like I was, and I started to recognise it in my dad. When my mum died, he's not. And because he's older and retired, he slowed down, so I recognised it. So someone had tipped off that doctor, and they were trying to cover their tracks, it seemed. And I wrote this Dr Marshall letter, said, look, I don't want to be registered. I, I want the opportunity to vet my doctor. And I want, A, I want official acknowledgement of your unregistering me. That was my first request, to unregister me from this doctor's. And I said, and, and the second point, I said, I want my medical files amended, and I didn't want to go through a lawful pr process. I, I thought, well, let's, I, I, I just do it, you know, and see if they would do it. And um, she, she starts, um, she phones me up. I don't get a reply to the letter. I don't get any of my requests made to have my medical doc, uh, documents changed and unregistered. So I still don't, haven't had a response to know if I'm unregistered or not. My dad's still registered. Uh, and I, I was discussing with my dad if I'm doing that and him undoing it, which he's agreed to because he's, you know, I've helped him realise what's been going on and 
associating to it and he, he understands and he can agree but he let go and he he's back into his disassociation and because he's old it, it's too too much for him or or he just switches he just can't deal with it and he's been, he's been through a lot he's just uh worn out he's burnt out like me and so I didn't get a, 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 a written response, a lawful written response. I got a threatening phone call. Now, phone calls trigger me. And, and, and I believe that they know what my triggers are. One's a phone and one's being locked in a... It's being in, the, in a room in secret and being abused and lied to. It, it shuts me down. It's dentists. It's, I've been abused in dentists. You know, I, I could tell you all about that. And I, I probably have on some video. I've, I've puked it all up. So I didn't get a written response. I got a verbal insult. You're paranoid. And I said, well, you go and check my record. You check my medical record in hospital. And she said, well, there's never, ever a Dr. Barrack here. And I said, you're lying. I said, um, I, I said I've got the NHS card with the registration of us being registered as a family to that doctor. So don't tell me she doesn't exist and try and brush me out. And then she said, oh, you're paranoid and hung up on me. And then um, literally um, that afternoon I get a knock at the door and it's a social worker and a doctor. She'd sent them on from another surgery around to section me, to, to target me. That triggered me on the doorstep. They wouldn't tell me their intentions. So I could start to see how they're all connected and how they work together to cover up this abuse. They all toe the line. So that's the whole surgery complicit with it and this other surgery. So that's the, the scenario. That's a brief in, uh, flash and insight into the, into the scenario that I was facing with, to do with medical care. And so it's closed down and there's no hope of me getting any care. When I, my lung collapsed, I was left to dead. Uh, when my mum, you know, I've experienced my mum go through it, left for dead. My brother, left for dead. You know, so it's not a place I want to go without a tank and some armed guards and some salty people who, can, who know what's going on and will, will watch my back when I'm too, when A, I'm, I'm unable to be triggered and I've got, I've got a lawful witness. Without that lawful witness, it's your word against them. And this is the thing, if you're trauma-based disassociative, and they know it, lawfully you're deemed a diminished responsibility. But they don't tell you that. And they might not necessarily diagnose you with the right diagnosis. They keep you in the ignorant. And because you, they know, before you've realised, you've got no lawful rights. So they've got ownership over you because they know that it's your word against them and you're not a credible witness in court because you're a diminished responsibility. And that's how they assassinate your character before you've even worked out what's going on. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ turned out on its head and, and lifted me up out of it, right? So I can stand up to these people. And that's what I got on the phone, so I, they have to try the section. And then they try with electronic harassment and I've been through all these different neighbours trying to <laughs> assault me and, you know, I've just hung on and enjoyed it because I, I trust in my Lord. and. He, you know, ups and downs like this. I've, I, I, he's been consistently able to, you know, meet me when I need him and uh, get me through it, help me deal with it, and, and grow as a, as a person, as a Christian, as a believer. So that's the handling I had. So you can see why I was reluctant. So I, I confirmed the uh, symptoms and. Uh, on the NHS site and then I phoned and then got shut off and then I phoned 101 and got uh, again hung up on and I, I just couldn't believe it and I thought is it me and they're trying to make out that oh no we can't do that and then I thought well my only option is 999 and I thought I weren't going to ring 999 although I can justify it as an emergency because it is a crime my life is in danger my dad's life's in danger but I thought I'd go the other routes first. And so I call 999 and I tell her it's a crime and I don't mention my medical emergency this time. I just say about my murder of mum and I record this time, I thought, right, I'm going to get my dictaphone, I'm, it's got such a sensitive mic, I'll strap it to the headset, ring 999, I'll record it, 
whatever happens, and I, I, I didn't know what to expect, I didn't have any expectations, but having experience having the phone hung on me up from 111 and 101, A reporting a murder to both of them, because eventually I had to say what it was about and why I, why I couldn't go to my doctors and why I couldn't go to the hospital, because they're handling me, they're trying to shut me down, they're trying to cover up their crimes. So, and then to realise that, well, it looks like you're, you're, you're in on this, now, whether they realise they're in on it, but they're in on it, and I and I get the f prompting. Well, they know my phone's being monitored, so they know that I've made the one 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 last night on the internet. They also know that I've phoned one one one. So, hypothetically, if there is someone there waiting to gate me, they would have intelligence on this phone call, so they know what I'm going to do next. Because I, you know, I, I I'm speaking to my dad, and if if they got. Um, a way of listening in, they would know in advance what my plans are. They would know where I was going shopping, what food I was buying, if I discuss it with my dad, um, and etc, etc. So you, the, potentially they can gate you and meet you, and they know your limitations, so that's where, that's where I'm, I know where my vulnerable points are, and that's where I'm targeted. That's where I'm harassed in the street. Not always, but occasionally the, 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 there's some activity in these areas. Even with my dad, you know, there's been inconsistencies with his things that he he's happened that that can only really be uh, he's been targeted, he's been gaslighted, and you know, um, interrupted. They sort of like um, block the process, and it, it sort of like creates almost like an Alzheimer's or dementia symptom. So they could be trying to. Uh, say my dad's got dementia, so they can section him and uh, dis use it against me. You know, I, I don't know. I'm just, I just have to consider. Well, I've had all this activity. I've got to be on guard and vigilant to what else. So I'm always looking out. So you might think I'm paranoid. I'm not paranoid. I'm just, um, you know, uh, conscientiously consider. You know, I don't say it's a fact. I'm being followed. Uh, you know. I have been followed, and but that doesn't mean I'm not being followed, or I might be followed. So I'm sort of trying to, you know, gauge my way through, you know, vigilantly. So when I had the thought, well, hang on a minute, one, of, the first one hanging up on me was, you know, I thought, well, I'll try one one. But for them to hang up on me, especially when I told them about the death of my brother, the death of my mum, and it just, they're just like cold-hearted psychopaths. Oh, we can't help you that. And I'm going to have to hang up now. And before, before I can explain any further, you know, and I was telling them. So again, I record that on the thing. And then I thought, right, 999. I'm going to record this one. <laughs> and, it, and if I don't get anywhere, I'm going to put it on YouTube. So that's what this is all about. This is what this video is all about. Put in the conversation I had with 999. So I've reported, A, first I said the me medical emergency with a crime, then I said it's a crime and then told him about the medical emergency, and then I thought, I'm not going to bother about the medical emergency, I'm just going to tell him about, confess the murder, I'm going to tell him about the murder and I want a crime number, I want to see a constable or a police detective constable, and I want a reference number and a crime number. I'll do, and then I'm going to leave it like that, and, and, and I'm going to play, so you're going to hear from this moment forward, so you're going to see, um, I don't know what order I put, but you'll see in order, I put it in order of um, events. So this is throughout the, the morning and into the afternoon. The phoning of 111, the phoning of 101, and the phoning of 999. And the 999 one's the one that's recorded, and the two are my um, agitation and personal journaling because if I if I don't journalize it I uh, I got short-term memory problems and recalling things and I've I got all this burden and you you, you want to unload it you, if it's unresolved it's sick it's spinning around in your life and you want to you want to get it off your chest so I thought I didn't have no expectations with 999 but I thought at least I'll get a constable and uh, I'm gonna play that last so I'm gonna close there and I'm going to wish everybody the best and I'm going to close in the name, wish everybody love and, uh, you know, and good health.
um, and to warn people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ to seek that of all your heart, to seek the Lord and God, seek God the Father, God the Son, and, and through God the Son you will know the Almighty God, and Jesus is Almighty God, he's the Word of God, he's the Son of God, and he's the only Saviour and only way and he's the only truth. He's the only one who's going to help you and deliver your life. So it's my invitation for you to just accept what I have and lay hold. Because today is the day of your salvation. You may not be here tomorrow. One of the ones may not be here tomorrow. And if you can't cope with what you're going to experience. Or you might be in line for the sort of process I've just described. And you may be wondering, you know, is this guy fantasising? Is he a bit of a, a nut job? No, I'm giving you a sober, honest account of my experience so I can warn other people about it. But the most important thing above all, above all politics, above, above all put in the world, right, is your salvation. And today is that day. Your day is one life and you're born before death's doors. You know, life is, life in unbelief is, is all inevitably going to be lead to death. The only way to escape physical death and spiritual death is through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the death, burial and resurrection. He's the, only, he's the only religious head who's laid his life down. He's the only religious um, head who's promised, a faithful promise to those who believe. And your salvation will be received. Your salvation is Jesus Christ. And you will know him the moment you believe and trust him. And you won't need me to tell you. So that's my invitation. And don't, don't procrastinate. Because if you procrastinate the day of your probation, you may never get the opportunity. And hell is a very long time. And God's just. And he's bound by his justice. He ain't going to take any, any wishy-washiness. He, he, he requires you to accept his son, who he's laid down his life. He's offered his son. His son has offered his life to glorify his father. You reject that, you reject life. You're the most selfish person that's ever walked the planet. You will spend your life in hell if you just go, oh Jesus, religion, a lot of rubbish. Forget religion. I could tell you more about religion than you and how disgusting and rubbish it is. And other people would say the same thing. So don't be deceived by these, all these, all this organised religion and we, you know, all this irreverent behaviour and all this modern kick on it and spin. It's all rubbish. The gospel has remained sober and consistent since the beginning. Love thy neighbour as thyself. You know, the, love God with all your heart. And the only way to love God with all your heart is to know that love. Then you'll be able to love God. You'll be able to love all men. Yourself first. You will love yourself because you've been loved. That gives you the ability to love anybody. Whether, you, whether they hate you, whether you want to kill them. Whether you want to get revenge, you'll still love that person and, you, and that will stop you. The Lord Jesus will stop you from doing what you couldn't stop yourself, the anger. And, and it put a break on it, it put a stop. You, you know, and, and you would have to really be hard pushed to, to, to allow your natural weakness to go where it would go. He, he will help you overcome that, he'll give you victory over that. So that's my testimony and um, I'm going to add the footage after this. So every blessing and uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Oh, just a just a memo. Twenty seventh of September. Um, need uh, I needed emergency uh, medical assistance, but I also need legal advocacy. So.
so um, I wanted to report a crime and the concealment and uh, of my medical treatment and I can't go to the hospital where my mother was uh, neglected so I rung with with some serious symptoms I got I put them on online and it said it's uh, urgent so then I rang 111 and I refused at that time not to give my name because of the uh, false counsel on my medical record and I didn't want them to um, be given false counsel and biased any treatment and on, on the voice recording it says that I don't have to give the details but when I spoke to the caller which I said the call was recording that I did have to get the details and when I explained the reason why I couldn't give the details because of crime and I couldn't seek medical help she hung up on me I done I phoned 101 and thought well I'll, I'll go to the police report the crime and I explained that I needed help with medical emergency but first I need to, a police officer to report the death of my mother and my brother she said you need a medical emergency and I explained oh, I can't have a me I can't go to the hospital where my mother was murdered without uh, advocacy and I'd like a police officer and she hung up on me so I just want to document that and also note that both of these uh, phone calls were cl well the the 111 was claimed to be recorded and I like to s and just to make a note to f double check that that was recorded so I can get a copy of it whether it really exists or whether it's going to be erased so there's no trace of my conversation it's my word against theirs and I'm shut down in this lie so I'm just making a a note of my experience for my own record and the date I've given the date 27th Friday 27th of September and it's about it's 11.50 a.m. Oh, P.S. Um, I also explained that I was um, post-traumatic stress and uh, trauma-based disassociative, and um, that di that that didn't but that didn't even register. I wasn't even considered, and I said I'm vulnerable, and and I've been threatened, and and um, I explained that I can't go to the med medical emergency about any advocacy. Where am I going to get advocacy if I'm hung up by the law and the police? And the medical profession so this is how i'm gated this is how it's shut down because they know what they already know what to expect so they can direct who is that going to answer my phone because they've already been tipped off and then they divert the call to these handlers and these handlers just are cold hearted evil people and they hang up Have the place, please. Thank you. Emergency. Hello there. Um, my name's Andrew Hopgood, and um, I'm in. I need some help, um, and I would like to report some crime, some ongoing crimes for many years, and I've not. I've been unable to report it up to this time. Um, because uh, of indirect threats from my local doctor's surgery and it's regarding my brother's death many years ago and my mother's will they uh, willfully neglected to treat my mum and covered it up and I was alone and I'm traumatised Right Andrew, I'm sorry, this is not something we can deal with on the 999 emergency Well, I, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't assist me on 101 and they've rejected me on um, 111 so I have nowhere to go but you and that's where they diverted me to so uh, they wouldn't have diverted you to this line I'm sorry it's for emergency zones this is an emergency because no, I'm it's not, it's not life and death emergency. well this is the law there's a crime being committed my life's in danger well I just have I just reported murder and they just flipping ignored me like you have so you're blocking, you're, I've, I'm being blocked from the free course of the law, so... No, you're not being blocked from the free course of the law. Well, where is it then? Where am I... Reported to 101. I've just reported it to 101, madam. So what am I supposed to do? I'm desperate, I've got... Uh, you can use the, um, 99, you can use the online reporting service. 
Well, what? Really? Yes. Well, well oh, okay, thank you. report it online because it'll disappear and I won't get a receipt so I've recorded this phone call unfortunately I didn't record the other two calls and I uh, the, the person I spoke to on 111 was uh, a woman called Adrian she hung up on me because uh, I, I, I explained well I've explained already um, then I phoned 101 explained the situation they don't listen that's an emer medical emergency they said well, the medical emergency is it, it is joined to to the criminal emergency. So, it, if they can't separate the two, that one is appropriate to the other, and the danger is that um, the people that mistreated my mother and my brother both are operating lawfully and medically in Frimley Park Hospital. So why am I going to go? Why am I going to call the emergency service to be on my own, traumatised, without any advocacy? Which is why I've called the police to report the crime. So at least I got some protection. So while I go into hospital, because I'm really unwell and I'm being targeted in my own home, and they slam the phone on you, nine nine nine, one o one, and one one one. It's disgusting. It's all set up so you you're kept down in the ditch. I'm going to have to proceed with um, a lawyer. I'm going to have to find an advocate, uh, you know, and let them deal with it and uh, carry on patiently to uh, the next step. Anyway, that's that. Not an emergency. How will she know it's an emergency? That, that To me, that's gated. To me, that's a gated call. And because and I phoned, um, you know, call me paranoid, but I've I've got a right to be paranoid. Uh, it, it to me, it's like someone's overseeing it, and they, this call was prepared for, you know, and and it's sort of like waiting. And so when I ring nine nine nine, I go for, right through to the person that's going to handle me. Oh, this isn't an emergency. Go online. I go on. I'm not going to go online because I know what's going to happen when I go online. I, you know, I, I it's not. I've been experiencing this sort of treatment all through my life. You know, do this, do that, and then they, then it's like you're on your own. It's our word against yours. Hence why I recorded the conversation, so I've got evidence. I've got at least got one of the phone calls. Uh, the other phone call should have been recorded. One advertised that it was, but the other one didn't. So my only prayer is that um, someone's overseeing this and listening in, and that, that you know they're aware. Uh, you know these uh, these uh, pitfalls, and they are pitfalls. These people are um, are conditioned and trained, and 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 they go along with their training. They didn't even ask me anything about the crime. Oh, this is not an emergency. One o one goes. Oh, this isn't a one o one matter. Um, well, well, you know, I, it is it is crazy. You know, even though I said um, it's a medical emergency, but it's also a criminal emergency, I'm still being persecuted in my own home and lied about. You know, my whole life's been covered up with false medical reports. You know, and they talk about mental health. You know, tell, go and tell someone. Go and look what you get when you go for health. This is what trauma-based disassociated, disassociated people go through. They're gated and they're kept down in the ditch. And, it, and, in, and all you face is this programmed... Uh, corporate blimmin uh, training where they go on they, they stay on track and uh, you know it does make me wonder that uh, some somebody's overseeing it and diverts the call they monitor my home I know I know that they uh, can listen into our home because and and see in our home at some time because I hid a medical doc document that would have proved it definitely proved that my mum was uh, there was different there was contradictory reports. The hospital said my mother did not have a serious infection. The nurses uh, when my mum came out after fighting to get my mum out of hospital because they 
intended not to leave. They they intended to leave there from the beginning. It broke down from the beginning. I'm qualified in distributing medication, and they cut out uh, the the medication that's stopping her brain swelling. They said, oh, "Don't worry about that." Well, I said, "Of course I'm going to worry about that." My mum worried about it, and these. Uh, my mum had dysphagia; she couldn't speak, so she's getting frustrated because because they stopped her medication. They got a psychiatrist and deemed her unfit. So that means they can shut her down and they can shut me down. Her head swell and she starts having seizures. She's got a serious infection. They refused to treat it and passed her from one ward to the other with me chasing her after her, the disassociated son. No advocacy. No one would listen to me. I never got to speak to the consultants because they all left me hanging. And I couldn't get in to see my mum when I needed to, any time I liked, which I arranged from the the beginning with a matron she she agreed that I could go and see my mum any time because of my mum's frustration and then what do I find that they've f flipping cable tied her to the bed my mum's in tears and because she can't speak there's no report of it and then I find out that they're, they're not that they're not handing over the shift properly <laughs> this is a this is the European Union stranglehold and and, and planting these dumbos in, in positions of authority. So when you've got an emergency, well, it's quite easy to gate people and shut them down. And then people, the, 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 the general public, get all the help. People like me get this treatment throughout their lives. Doctors, they make up things about you. They write things about you. And they write what they like. You say something to them, it'll be translated into something else if you don't check the notes. And when you check the notes and say, look, I want that remedied, you start getting persecuted, you get threats on the phone. You write, you don't get a reply by letter, you get a threatening phone call which triggers you. And I'm kept in this agitated, anxiety state. I've got flipping, um, excuse my language, I've got tones playing in my house 24 hours a day. I've got neighbours playing games and they deny that they can hear a tone. And then when I, when I get a visit around, I ask, can they hear it? And, they, and most people can hear it. A few people have lied. But most people are honest and say, yeah, I can hear that. It's like, it goes on 24 hours a day. And it's, it, it's, it, it keeps you in a constant state of distraction. It's like water torture. I've had it for almost four years. It is breaking me and it is making me ill. And I've got my vulnerable dad. I live with my vulnerable, vulnerable dad. And so, you know, I... I'm a, this is, I look after him and this is the uh, sort of treatment I've got and this is the sort of burden I can't move um, you know it's, and I've got no advocacy I've got no legal advocacy so that's my um, I think that's going to be my next protocol and uh, approach but I'm going to I am going to do a video and uh, stick this online and uh, you know and uh, let people know what sort of get an idea of, of how other people are treated what's going on under the radar all under this official oh we can't do no wrong you know you got to do that you got to do this and then you do it and then you're still not met you you met with forked tongues double speak and lip service and that and that's our and that's under the watch of this blooming government um you know it's disgusting anyway that's that Please excuse the uh, nakedness. I'm just documenting this uh, rash. I think I think I got an infection. I'm really unwell. I'm stressed. I'm not recovering. I'm not getting any rest. Not any physical rest. I get spiritual rest in Christ, but I don't get any um, mental rest. And I'm kept agitated and traumatized, and I have been all my life. And that's divisive. It's it's it, it's it's main. It, obviously, it's mainly the it's Satan, but it's also the way that the establishment and regulation set up, and also the um, the uh, profiling the characters and then putting certain people in certain roles because they're going to behave a certain way. So that they know how that's going to affect the service and how it's going to affect one person and not another. And when you're dis dissociated, I keep saying disassociated, but it's disassociation, and I've got a trauma-based disassociation. So I just want to document the rash. And now, if I go to the hospital, I've got no advocacy or protection. I've got no one to say, come and... I can't burden someone and say, look, we, you know, would you 
stick around or at least be aware that I, I want to go in hospital because it's not easy to stick some poison in your mouth indirectly and you're you're done for and they're just all the law says is provide a readable, reasonable service it'd be so easy to bump me off in the hospital that's why I wanted a copper that's why I wanted a policeman so a lawful constable who who would act lawfully I've reported three murder I've reported murder three times today and been ignored and that's preventing me from getting medical attention so I want to I'm hoping I'm going to I can get I can um, vacate for a while and um, fast this out and prayer uh, flush it out with some more you know lots of fluids get some vitamin C and get myself into a nice restful um, circumstance and recover by the grace of God so thank God that um, you know I couldn't have coped without my Saviour the Lord my Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit and and the Lord Jesus is just um, I, you can kind of see the, get it from my voice the nerve I'm, I was trembling I was in such a trauma it triggers a trauma it re-traumatizes me and that trauma goes back to being a two-year-old so it's so easy to manage people you just lie and that's what uh, my that's what that's my trauma-based conditioning it's it uh, it was concealed which is a lie so when I when in a concealed room and I'm lied to it, it will trigger me into a trauma and that's where I'm handled in doctor surgery anywhere and and that sometimes that's by design and sometimes that's just by you know uh, ambiguous uh, human behavior so I've got it all on all on the back of my legs and um, this is what disassociate people go through this is what trauma based satanic ritual abuse people go through and mine, my, uh, mine's exactly the same it, it's a uh, it's it's related to the same thing it's just not so direct it was indirect using my family to do the trauma in without their well as far as i'm aware without their knowledge and I, I'll, I'll go into that another time so there's my rash um so that could be septicemia i could have a i haven't been treated for a car accident they've done this with my car accident i've been to the doctors i've been to a clinic i qualify for money to see a specialist they took the money and diagnosed me before they look at me and wrote up the report so there's no record of it I checked with my doctor what the record was and um, you know it, there it was that you know I'm all happy with it and it's all all okay and there's no there's no there's no official record of, of what I've reported to my doctor it, these medical people at the Virgin Medical Centre and that uh, and that's how I was treated. That's how I'm gated. That's how that's how trauma based people are easily shut down, put in the ditch and squashed out of life. I wouldn't have been able to get through my teenage years without without the Lord. You know, I, I, well up until last twenty, I was in a crisis. I'm still in that crisis today. I'm being kept in that crisis constantly by you know by by design. Um, and, and just by being vulnerable so the Lord is just like picks me up every time strengthens me you know helps me stop blowing my top and bashing somebody's brains out and I'm not going to do that I'm going to you know I'm going to I'm going to hold on to my to prayer and faith and the Lord will deliver me through these circumstances but sometimes I really lose it I really do feel like you know, I thought I better stop myself from going to get, commit a crime to get arrested to draw attention to myself. And I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to just be patient, wait on the Lord, and see how how this evolves. So hopefully, I, I just request for people to um, pray, pray for me, and um, and we'll blot you in the face I'm sweating I've got a temperature that's another thing I've got a temperature of uh, 36 it was up all night 36 to 37 degrees Celsius which is about 95 my temperature is at a constant 95 degrees I haven't had any sleep because it's I, I just get cooked in my room and when I get out of my room I'm not cooked so I, I still consider I'm being electronically harassed where I sleep so I'm kept in this constant temperature, but this temperature is to do with a fever. 
I got an infection, I got a fever. So, it, you know, I might, I might not even survive this. Um, well, you know, the Lord's will be done and uh, I trust the Lord. You know, whether I live or die, I, I die in Christ. And if I live, I live for Christ. So hallelujah and praise God because uh, I, I, I'm praying and hoping and asking. So I request, request people to pray that um, I can find um, a born again Christian or um, an advocate who, who can help me get um, a legal aid and who will stand and fight and advocate for me because I can't cope with it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a serious mental breakdown. The, the, what I've been through, no one could, you know, you, you, I, I'm not boasting, but Guantanamo Bay, what's that, Butlins? That's just like nothing, what I've been through. And and I couldn't do that on my own strength. So I'm at the point of cracking, that's what, and, and this infection is what made me get up and do something, because I've been threatened. Um, all the evidence is gone, so it's it's easy to put someone down as para, paranoid or a tinfoil hat wearer or a conspiracy theorist. And that's how they, they just brush the attention away to a low, you know, to ignorant deaf ears. So, so please pray that I can get advocacy, and then they can come to me. When this hopefully this will go online, so I'd encourage you to share this. I'm not I'm not seeking for it to go viral, but because I think that my my web page is gated, and there's only only a few people are filtered through, and that's done by the cert, you know, the the. the um, the processor, the the control of it, the overseer and the head of it, and it can uh, traffic. It can control the traffic to who who sees what. Um, he, you know, when I first uh, started up my site, in five minutes I'd get six, seven hundred hits. Now I'm getting seven, four, five, twenty-three. You know, I, and I don't, I don't mind because because it only takes one to share it, and uh, and uh, so I I just ask people because uh, and consider other people going through this. Please share this, not for my, you know, not for my sake, but for for good sake, for mercy's sake, for the Lord's sake, for right sake, and. Um, you know, maybe this will send a message to people, and that will encourage other people to share their testimonies. And then they they will, you know, I pray to the Lord they will come to me to try and remedy this. And then then I'm going to turn it around. Say on your bike. Now you get off my property. You don't come around here begging because you want because now I've put it online and you're scratching around to cover it up. I'm going to show this and shame you. You know, I'm not, I'm not after money, I'm not after suing you. I just wanted some peace in my life so I can get on and serve my Lord. And I get this, I get shut down, flipping lied about, it's disgusting. So there might be other people going through the same thing and it, it encourage them to, um, you know, post a video. And it might, maybe it'll wake people up to see what, you know, what's going on in this world, uh, how, people, how people are treated and the reality of trauma-based conditioning. It, it, it is rife, and you know, there's a, it's a small, narrow bracket. Now, my, my hypothesis is that, I, is that I'm Jewish. My dad's Jewish, and my mum's Jewish. And the, and the most targeted people are Jews and born again Christians. And I've had, I've had worse, worse uh, adversity since I'm a Christian, but I've had this from, from year dot. My family's had this from year dot, and it continues. And the people in power are blooming uh, uh, loyal to the devil, to the the antichrist powers of this world, the Pope, and all the EU lot, you know. And if if people want to remain in the EU, well, remain in the EU, you know, remain a prisoner to the lie. And uh, you know, I don't, need, I've got no hope of we getting out of the EU anyway. I think they're going to block the No Deal, either put forward a referendum with no deal off the table, so it'll be just kicking the can up the road even further. So maybe this will wake people up so they can save their souls, save their lives, you know, and have some peace in life, even though it's awful and wicked, you know, you know I can rejoice. I can, I'm going to go out for a nice walk in a minute, but I've got to, I've got to pick this cross up. So please pray that I can move forward and, and uh, take the next step, and it, it will be to good, it will be for the good of others. And I, I'm going to close there, and uh, I'm going to include uh, my um, some voice conversations on the end about uh, of my experience today, 
um, last night with the temperature, I thought, well, I'm going to check this out, you know, to see, because I thought meningitis, and I thought if I've got meningitis, I'm a goner, because it's septic, and they're going to, you know, that, I'm not going to recover from that. So any brothers, please pray for me, you know, pr pray that I can be anointed and, for, you know, forgiven. I've got a multitude of sins, and uh, I can be, I can be covered. And I can recover, so I'm thinking about going away, getting out of the house, taking my dad somewhere. Um, I've not been able to do that only until recently, so I'm going to, you know, perhaps go away somewhere, have a rest and pray that I can recover. So please pray for my health, pray for my dad, that he be saved. And um, pray that I can resolve this and uh, get some advocacy. And... Uh, share this with and warn people warn people what this world's like warn people what the how, what liars people are you know it's all a facade it's all a it's all a, a, a shop window dressing and it, it, at the back it's a slaughterhouse it's lies it's delusion it's ignorance M most of the people in this country are ignorant and those in the know are a very small minority and, and so there's a, there's a lot, I've got a lot of faith in the Lord and the, the, and the law, and I think there's a lot of good people in this world. I just think it, it's, it's so difficult to overcome the, uh, the way they've wrote, wrote the system. The system's been designed to function in a certain way, and it's been thought through very carefully. And so they know how each person, each personality model, so they've been mapping personalities for centuries. And you only have to research, you'll, you'll see the evidence right before your eyes. So these are gates geared to process people in a certain way. And you only have to put the right people in the right places, the right personality in, in one job, or that job will, t will attract the personality, and then they can control the staff, and that controls the outcome of the service. One person will get one service, another person will get another service. So it doesn't necessarily have to be one big conspiracy. It's just the way it's set up and it looks after itself. Because it's very cunning. These people are very clever at thinking things through. And they're, you know, they're, they're organised and they're um, experienced. And they, uh, you know, they've got think tanks. Now they've probably got computers and uh, supercomputers and... Uh, algorithms that they, they, they can fine-tune their work and, and then our technology is rolling out you it, it's closing down you're getting shut down my whole my whole um, community shut down wherever you go uh, sins of vice shut down we're well, not literally shut down but you'll be shut down you won't get anywhere they just toe the line or advise you you, you know when they've broken the law they advise you to accept it you know it's not it's not right you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a citizen, a British citizen, born in this country. I've got a right, I've got a right to, you know, I started questioning myself, Am I, was I unreasonable? And I would slap myself, come on, you know, don't, don't take this passively. Uh, stand up, you know, stand up to this abuse, you know, it's, uh, I'm not going to be moved, only if the Lord's willing. So I'm going to stand in faith, of, you know, please pray for my health, pray for an outcome, pray, pray, pray for a good outcome for our government, our royal family, our houses, our parliament, you know, let's pray that they, they change their ways and they get their act together. Well, those good, good people with a, a bit of salt in them are left and they can, uh, you know, make amends and um, beat this, but the, the Lord will judge people on what they choose, so this could be beginning of the end. I don't know, I'm just going to look up, so I want to encourage any, anyone, anyone to share this and uh, wish, it, wish people well and uh, uh, to be blessed and to be protected and delivered from these sort of pitfalls and machinations and, and their intent, their violent and wicked intent and uh, you know, uh, every blessing to, to uh, my brothers and sisters and uh, Maranatha, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen.